I love your jacket. Thank you. It looks beautifully warm and sunny there, is it? Where are you? Gorgeous. Yes, in Los Angeles. Oh, phenomenal. <laughs> uh, we will start in a second. Is there anything that I need to know before we start, Melora? I'll, I'll record the intro afterwards and all of that. Okay. You, I'm sure you've done a million of these. You know how it works. I have. I um, was unable to get whatever this thing is. It's supposed to be running the whole time. I don't Zen know how caster? to make that happen. Okay. So, yeah, I, I tried. Um, you hear how my pitch just went up there on that okay? Okay. That, my friends, is the beauty of recording a podcast during a global pandemic. So many technical difficulties from everyone's end, but we got there. our own IT people, haven't we, in lockdown? My name is Mia Friedman, and you're listening to No Filter, a weekly interview podcast with people who tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be all kinds of vulnerable. There are two types of actors, the ones whose names you instantly recognise and whose lives you know loads about. And then there are the actors whose names might not be familiar, but whose faces and characters loom large. So if my guest's voice sounds familiar to you, chances are you've probably watched Stan's hit show The Bold Type, or perhaps Transparent. And if you're not, then let me introduce you to Melora Harden. Melora was born into a family of actors and got her first role when she was just six years old. Since then, she's been acting, singing and dancing on shows such as The Love Boat, remember that, and movies like 27 Dresses or 17 Again. She's an actor's actor, a Hollywood veteran, and in 2017 she became everyone's favourite boss, Jacqueline Carlyle on The Bolt Type. It's a cult hit show with millions of women, including this one, and it's based on a fictionalised version of Life at US Cosmo magazine. Melora is based in LA with her husband, Gildart Jackson, who is also an actor, and he also happens to play her husband on The Bold Type. And their two teenage daughters are locked down with them as well. Like the rest of the world, they've been spending a lot of time together. And she did this interview on the balcony of her home. So if you hear sirens and traffic, that's why. On this episode, we touch on everything from that old chestnut, the global pandemic. I'm good. I'm fine. I mean, you know, it's whatever. I'm resilient. (laughs) But there have been some good things about it. And I'm also very tired of it. And I'm very sad about it. And I have lots of conflicting feelings. And it's ruining the economy and there's so many things, but um, I don't know. I feel so conflicted. It's like such a bad thing to talk about for me right now because today in particular, I'm just like all over the map with it. And also choosing to work with her husband. It actually, you know, it's so funny because he always says like, well, you know, great to be married to the star of the show. And it's like, well, come on. I mean, that's <laughs> really not how it happened. They actually said to me they were going to cast you know, someone to play my husband. And, you know, they said, well, he's English. He's going to be English. You've been married for 20 years and you have two boys. And I was like, my husband's English. We've been married 20 years. We have two girls uh, and he's an excellent actor and could easily play a photojournalist, which is who they Mm. they wanted the character to be. I said, why don't you just take a look at his reel? And it was just too good to be true. It was like, they looked at it and they were like, well, obviously, (laughs) you know, we have a lot of fun. I mean, I think we have the best times in our marriage when we are playful. And um, we both are naturally playful. And I think it's something we both value about each other and about just the family dynamic in general. So, yes, it's when it gets all serious is when it's like not good. <laughs> like, what is going on? <laughs> Laura peels back the curtain on life in Hollywood and life as an actor. Here's our conversation. You've been working as an actor since you were six. You have the most extraordinary body of work. Not everyone makes it the transition from a child actor to a young adult actor, to yeah. an adult actor. How did you transition through those stages? What were the most challenging stages to go through? I mean, I think that I was fortunate in the sense that I was raised by two actors who highly valued the craft of acting over mm. everything else. I was taught to value the craft of acting and, and the art of acting above anything else, really, and just in general my childhood was really all about honing my skills. Like I started dancing when I was five and I was a really serious ballerina and went to Joffrey Ballet on scholarship when I was 13 and was acting since I was six and taking acting classes with my mom who was an acting teacher for the likes of Leonardo DiCaprio and Jessica Biel and, and many, many others. And I took with Stella Adler when I was 18, um, you know, and singing lessons and, and ballet and jazz. And like, I was always honing that craft mm. 
that was valued so highly in my family dynamic. And I was like super passionate about it all. So like I loved it and wanted to do it and couldn't get enough. And yet I would say, you know, I was taught like a lot of discipline and I also a lot of joy around sort of what it means to be an artist and what it means to be an actor. So I think that's a big part of why I was able to make the transition easily. I also think like just very basic things that are just, I just got lucky, which is that, you know, sometimes kids are like super cute, but they're not very beautiful or they're not very attractive as they get older. They're also not comfortable sometimes with their own sexuality, which is something you have to be able to move into if you're going to be a leading lady or you're going to be um, that type of a person. And I found like people, you know, sometimes it just didn't match up with the way they looked or, mm. you know, what they're, you know, so it's like, for me, I just was lucky that like the way I looked and the way I was growing as a person were kind of matching up and running parallel. And as far as like what the most challenging thing was, I think for me, the most challenging thing was, was just getting a, my head around this idea of what it meant to be a celebrity. And it was almost like maybe there was judgment about that <laughs> in my nuclear family. So for me, kind of getting my brain around what was positive about that, mm. what that looked like, how that would look good to me, how that would feel good to me. Yeah. So I think I had to kind of chart my own blueprint into that arena of just the transition from you know, teenager to young adulthood and what that looked like and why I ultimately found that it was useful because when you are kind of a racehorse, you want to run with other racehorses. And that's really the best part of getting success so that you can be challenged and inspired and be working with peers that are at your level or even further ahead so that you can really be challenged and keep pushing and keep growing. I'd never thought about the idea of the fame being separate to the craft yeah, I, I hadn't either until I started working with a with a certain therapist who actually distinguished for me that there is a big difference between craft and career and that they are separate. And that was a really excellent revelation for me that I would love to share with any artist and young actor because, um, yeah, it's like I was really raised, and I think my father, who you know was a journeyman actor, I think he really believed that good craft equaled good career, and it's really not true. I mean, there are people who are excellent actors who have terrible careers. There are people that are terrible actors who have excellent careers. Right. So I think that it, they both take a certain kind of attention and they take a certain kind of um, skill set, which you can hone. You can hone both sides of that. And it's important to do so. As a, a child and a teenager and then a young woman in Hollywood, and an actor, how do you marry the constant disappointment and the constant rejection? I mean, I know it's not all rejection, but there's more rejection for an actor than there would be, you know, for someone who worked in IT, for example. How do you stay balanced through all of that? I mean, I think you always have to have other things that you're passionate about that you're doing because there's so much, there is downtime, especially when you're a younger person, you know, I saw my dad always have projects and he's an artist and, you know, he, he's always been sculpting and making things and, and he was passionate about that and making our homes beautiful and working on the house. And, you know, and I think for me, I feel the same way. I, I have other things that I'm passionate about that I feel very filled by, very nurtured by, um, so that if I'm not, you know, I'm not acting which really now isn't really so much a thing. But when I was younger, that was a thing. Like I had to, I did have to do that. And I guess, I guess it also just takes a certain personality type, to be honest. I really don't think that people that aren't resilient, if you're not resilient, you literally cannot be in this, in this career. Yeah. It takes incredible resilience and incredible ability to both be completely coming from all of you, all of the tools that you've garnered over the years, but also ability to be separate, to be able to like not have all this meaning of whether you do or don't get that part. Like it has all this meaning about mm. who you are because we are our own products. That can be a real confusion for people where they really turn in on themselves in a way that's really unhealthy. And I don't actually know why. I've often mused about that. Like I was in two of the highest, most self-focused careers being that I was, you know, a really serious ballerina. I thought I was going to be a ballerina, you know, and acting. And I don't have body issues and I never have. And I think I have a really healthy relationship with my body and my, and my physical self, even as I'm aging. 
And I feel like it's really interesting that, that I don't know why that is true. I just, it's probably something to do with my upbringing, but it also is just probably something to do with my, just who I am, my personality and, and kind of acceptance, you know, that's the other thing I think that would be a great thing for young actors to embrace, which is this idea of loss. You know, we start losing things from the moment we're born. And I think the faster you can embrace loss, the more joyful your life's going to be. Instead of like, I feel a lot like people are trying to hold and grasp onto this time, this moment, this, you know, and I think that like you've had a moment, once you've had a moment, you lose that moment. So I feel like it's like that kind of headspace, I think, Mm. helps facilitate more joy in your life and more, um, yeah, connection to what is happening right, right currently, rather than being 20 feet ahead or 20 feet behind. I'm around the same age as you and I feel always such gratitude. It sounds ridiculous, but like gratitude. When I see a woman on screen who looks like me and the women that I know. Yeah. And I mean, it's it sounds ridiculous to be so pathetically grateful. It's just such a rare thing. And that the comfort that you do exude in your skin and your body, that is obviously a conscious choice. Is it a choice that sometimes costs you work? No, I think it doesn't. I think ultimately, you know, I care for myself. I care for my body. I, you know, if I'm going to play someone who's supposed to have a ton of plastic surgery, I'll do everything I can to make myself look like I've got plastic mm. surgery, but mm. I'm not going to go get plastic surgery because my characters are separate from me. And I think that's another thing that sometimes young actors do is they confuse kind of what they are as a product with who they are as a person. And you need to really keep that separate. You need to remain you And for me, like, I love going as far out on a limb as I can to play someone completely different because that's just, that just feels like playing in a sandbox to me. Although I think Jacqueline on the bold type is not Mm. that far from me, but she is different than me for sure. Whereas some of these characters I've played, like Tammy Cashman was like a huge, you know, shift from who Melora really is. And that was a wonderful thing. Although Tammy has lots of qualities that that Melora has, of course, because we're drawing on our own toolbox. I want to ask you about that. I want to ask you about actually Tammy and Jacqueline in terms of their two of the more recent iconic characters you've played. You were nominated for a primetime Emmy for Tammy. For those who don't, who haven't seen Transparent and who don't know the character of Tammy, can you explain a little bit about her? Because the first thing I did after I watched that and saw you was, look, who is this person? And then everything that I saw of you and I looked at your other work and stuff and I recognised you, I was like, there's nothing in your body of work that would have suggested, you know who'd be great for this part is (laughs) Melora. Yeah, that's right. It's so true. Um, Yeah, and I knew that. And so I, you know, I'm kind of at a place in my career where I really don't need to read for things much. But I kind of knew that I, you know, I knew that I needed to show them that like that I understood this person. So explain who Tammy is. So Tammy is, um, she plays the ex-girlfriend, college girlfriend of Sarah Pfefferman, who is the eldest daughter of the Pfefferman family in Transparent. And um, she kind of comes back into Sarah's life and Sarah's married. And Tammy is still attracted to her. Tammy's also married. <laughs> um, to Tig Natara. But, um, that's right, to Tig, yep, who's awesome. And she comes back to her life and they fall in love again. Tammy. What? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Hi. Sarah, wow. what are you doing? I mean, why are you, I thought your kid was older. Oh, that, that, and that's I love what Jill that. said when, uh, when we were making it. She said, you know, Tammy has the biggest balls of anyone on the set. Yeah. As a dancer, that was sort of one of the main things I hooked into about her was that I just I just felt the balls between my legs at all times. Because <laughs> she's quite butch. She's very sure very of herself. She's mm-hmm. very confident. And I think she's the only person on that show, at least in the in the first season, who really is totally clear on her sexuality, on who she is in the world. Uh, she's not waffling around. There's a lot of waffling going on on that show. Everybody's trying to, you know, experimenting yeah. and wondering and questioning. And Tammy doesn't question. She doesn't wonder. She's just flat out straightforward. This is who I am. How did you prepare? Uh, I, To be honest, I just hooked into her physically. I just understood her physically really, really, really well. So much so that I like it excited my imagination that when I went in um, to do the chemistry read with Amy Landecker, who played Sarah Fefferman, I bought like removable tattoos because I felt like Tammy would have lots of tattoos. And 
but I thought she would have like cool, like line tattoos, like simple, but like present. And I just sort of covered myself in tattoos. And I am sort of an actor that said a lot of times I really do work the outside in, which means I need to be able to pass a mirror and go like, oh, oh, hi. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Like, to take oh, yourself out of yourself. Here's Tammy. <laughs> yeah. So that's very important to me, like how I, how I look and how I feel in the clothes and particularly how they feel on me how my hair feels. Did you cut your I, hair afterwards? Yeah, I just said to my husband literally like three weeks before that, God, I, I hope I get something soon where they ask me to cut my hair. I'm so tired of my long hair. I just I just want to cut it all off. But I knew I couldn't do it until somebody was like saying, will you do it for this part? And that was something that was like a requirement, like must be willing to cut their hair. And I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, God. And how do you go home at the end of the day? Like you've cut your hair, you've got your fake tattoos, you've embodied Tammy, and then you go home to your husband and your family (laughs) and then you go back to work the next day. How do you, I mean, it might be obvious to you because you're an actor, but try to explain that process. Yeah, I mean, I guess some actors have a lot of trouble with that transition back and forth and in and out. Again, I mean, for me, I usually find the most challenging thing is that I end up buying clothes that the character <laughs> would play and shoes that the character would buy. That would be my favorite and part. I get, I get to the end of the show and I'm like, I will never wear that. Why did I buy that? That is so not me, you know? <laughs> so so, so many leather pants and motorcycle yeah. boots for Tam- Tammy's wardrobe was <laughs> next level. And Wasn't those sharp amazing. suits. Oh, I know. Incredible. <sighs> Incredible. Yeah. So you mean that you buy them just in your off time? I mean, obviously you don't have to buy your own clothes for your character. <laughs> no, no. But I will sometimes just find that if I'm out with a girlfriend shopping or something, that I'll be like attracted to something that's yeah. like really <laughs> sexy. And then I'm like, two months later, I'm like, that is so not sexy at all to me at all. So that's funny. Um, so I have a lot of clothes that represent characters that I've played and times in my life. And it's hard for me to release those things, actually. Um, There was one of those moments where I just went from work, picked up my kids and you do like a drive through at their school. And I was like driving in and I was like, hey, and I'm like waving. I'm like, hi, and their kids, other friends waving at everybody. And my young daughter, she was younger, you know, at the time she came up, she's like, mom, you still got all your tattoos on. You look so weird. (laughs) That must be so much fun. I had forgotten that I hadn't taken the tattoos off because sometimes if I was working a few days in a row, I would leave them on and then they would just, you know, we would just leave them on. Hi, I'm Melora Harden and you are listening to No Filter. The role that came after that again with such a departure to the point where I'd just finished watching Transparent, loved the shit out of it, and then started watching The Bold Type. And I'm a former editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan in Australia, so it was obviously a world very close to my heart and which I was ready to uh, be sceptical of, I suppose, because I've never seen it reflected in any way, honestly. And then your character walked in. I think she was wearing leather pants, actually. And I was like, she's so familiar. Who is she? <laughs> because you then had to become someone totally different to become Jacqueline, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, very different. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, and that was very important to me that, you know, always when I'm coming off of one character, I'm always very, like, mindful of, like, let's really make sure this is not a reflection of anything about the other character. And um, again, you know, Jacqueline has incredible wardrobe, and that wardrobe helps me a lot. You know, it helps me feel her and find her. And yeah, so. How did you decide uh, that you wanted to do that? So you'd come off transparent. You don't have to audition for things anymore. The part was offered to you. What was your decision-making process and then how did you prepare? Well, I mean, it was because I was coming off of Transparent and I had had such an incredible experience of not just doing good entertainment, but doing entertainment that also is doing good in the world. And I felt this like strong urge that, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to, the next thing I do, I want it to be putting out something good in the world that we need. And that's exactly what I felt the bold type was. Um, I was so struck by Jacqueline, by the fact that she's a woman of power who is also kind and has integrity and is supporting and mentoring her young employees, not cutting them off at the knees, 
that she has a marriage that is long term, that is um, real, that she has children, that she's balancing all of those things that I balance and you balance and mm. Joanna Coles balances and every other woman that I know who's successful at their job. And so I just felt like, you know, it's really time that people see that women who are successful are not bitches. Yes, there are women that are successful that are bitches, but I would say that those are the women that have had to struggle and fight so much in the male dominated world that they lost their sense of femininity. They lost their sense of womanhood and nurturing and maternal instinct that we all have. And I feel for them. I think that's a real, that's really bad. But I also think that they probably would have done better if they'd had a role model like Jacqueline to go like, huh, to maybe even question their own behavior. And I get so many comments about that from people who are, you know, watching the show where they say, you know, I uh, love the show because I want to be a boss like that, or I want to have a boss like that, like Jacqueline. I kept waiting for Jacqueline to be a bitch, as you yeah. say, because yeah. that's that trope, you know, yeah. and right. it was the first time because I was, I had the most incredible mentors in my career in magazines and I'd never seen that reflected on screen before because it's not the cheap and easy thing to do. Like Jacqueline being a bitch and undermining and the girls fighting with each other. People often say working with women is it very bitchy, but it can be intense, but it's very supportive, I find. I think so too. I love it. I actually love it. And I think women are so interesting the way that they, the way that we do things to me. And I, I'm currently making a documentary and, you know, I have a female story editor. I have a female editor. What's your documentary about? I've heard you refer to it before. Yeah, I mean, that's it is about women holding women up. It's about female friendship. It's about what it really takes to transform trauma. And it's about real life serendipity. And, you know, and I think the experience of it for me over the four, past four years that I've been making it has been sort of that wonderful spiraling that Jill Soloway writes so eloquently about as the feminine experience. And I just really wanted to capture that in this documentary and I'm really working hard and, I, and I, I'm finding it so rewarding to be working with so many women. And just the process is very different. The non-linear way that we think and then to embrace that, not to resist that or to feel that there's something wrong because we're not going A plus B equals C, but instead mm. we're kind of like circling around the C until we find the A and the B. And it's like, that is just so rewarding and refreshing and I think it's just creating a really interesting uh, way of telling this story. It's not a traditional, you know, not traditional documentary storytelling and I'm excited about that. The fact that you're doing that, it's interesting. So many actresses in particular in the last few years, they've started production companies or they've started businesses or they're now producing or directing like you have been. Is that something that's opening up to women because as an actress, in some ways you're a passenger, aren't you? You don't have that much control. Is this about women saying, I want to have agency over my career. I don't just want to wait to see whether I get this part or I'm offered that part. Right. And I, and I think that it takes a certain person. I don't think all mm. actors or actresses want to do that. I think that a lot of them are perfectly happy and stimulated and satisfied and fulfilled to be playing the characters they play and getting the jobs that they get. And that's the stretch for them. And that's good. I think that certain people want to go deeper, explore more. For me, it's not about control as much as it's about expression. It's just uh, a, another avenue of creative expression, another place to collaborate. I'm, a, I'm just like one of the greatest joys in my life is creative collaboration. And, you know, the more I do that in the more areas that I can, it's just hugely satisfying to me. Just finally, I wanted to ask you about your relationship with the three girls on the set. I shouldn't call them girls. They're women. The young actresses, one of whom is Australian. Mm -hmm. Yes, she is. <laughs> the relationship, obviously, between Jacqueline and Sutton, Jane and Kat, Kat. is mm -hmm. very much mentor-mentees. How does that sort of extend to your relationship offset? Yeah, I don't think it's very different. <laughs> I think it's pretty similar. I mean, if you think about, you know, art imitating life and life and imitating art kind of thing, um, you know, I'm an actor who's, you know, where I am with the success I have and have, you know, children and a husband and have all this experience. And they are young women 
until recently, none of them were married. One of them is now. And they're kind of in a similar place to their characters, Mm. whereas I'm in a similar place to Jacqueline. And so, you know, they as young actresses can certainly learn something from me as a sort of actor who's been doing this for... Many years. Let's just say many years. 40-something years. (laughs) You've worked in so many shows where I imagine, like particularly with TV series, you become really close to the cast and you're like a family. What happens? Is it a bit like a holiday romance and then you kind of accept it for what it is and then you move on? Because if you were remained intimately close with everyone you'd ever worked with, there would be not enough hours in the day. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it it happens the way it kind of happens in life which is that you gravitate towards certain people and certain people gravitate towards you. And um, you come away from some jobs with no friends, just having had maybe even a very successful professional experience with, but not some, not people that you would just have in your real life. Again, it's like the Melora part of my life and then the actor part of my life. Mm. And then every now and then, and it really is every now and then you actually come away with a friend. And, you know, that happened with me and Amy Landecker, you know, she's great and we're friends. And, and, and also it's funny because as a younger actor, I used to put a lot of pressure on myself. That was, and especially coming from being a child actor, because when you're a child actor, everybody embraces you, Mm. everybody bonds with you. They're so like, you know, and I remember when I moved into my twenties feeling sort of like that confusion of feeling like I was supposed to belong everywhere I went. Ah. And I remember my therapist saying, no, 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 no. I don't actually want you belonging anywhere that you don't choose, you know, because you have amazing people in your life. You have amazing friends. And those aren't people you belong with anyway. You know, those aren't people you would ever belong with. So don't try. And once you kind of realize you don't need to belong everywhere you go, (laughs) you kind of just like um, that was a a liberating idea. (laughs) Melora, thank you so much for the characters that you have brought to life. They are just so wonderful and uh, (laughs) I'm I'm just so appreciative. The Bold Type is one of my favourite shows and as someone who's lived in that world for my whole career, you really did it justice. The whole show did it justice in a way that I've never seen before. Oh, that means so much, especially coming from someone like you that has that experience. Thank you so much. We try really hard to really make the show realistic and also at the same time idealistic and it's wonderful to to hear that reflection so thank you very much you've certainly done that if you want to see melora in action you will recognize her face i promise you head over to stan and if you like this episode share it with a friend it was produced by leah porges the executive producer of no filter is eliza ratliff and i'm mia friedman i'll see you on mamamia.com.au Lots of love.